Now it's my pleasure to introduce someone who um, we, I've known Richard for longer than I think either of us care to remember. Um, whenever I think of IT and the law, I think of Richard Suskin. And you'll see from your program that he's currently the president of the Society for Computers and Law and an IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice, and also has written books including The End of Lawyers, which is a fascinating book. Um, but he's here also with his hat as chair of the advisory board of the Oxford Internet Institute. And we look to the Oxford Internet Institute as an example of how to do this stuff, how to take a big problem, a big interdisciplinary problem, and make a difference on the world stage. And that's what they've certainly done with the OAI. And we, if we aspire to be even half as good as they are, we'll be doing well. And it's also very, uh, it's a great privilege to work closely with them. They're part of the Web Science uh, Trust Network of Labs, so we run lots of joint events and uh, do a lot of collaborative research with Oxford. Uh, so, Richard, it's our privilege to listen to you this afternoon. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, punctuation is very important to lawyers, and so I know it's not particularly gracious to disagree with the introduction, but my book was called The End of Lawyers? Question mark, not, the, not The End of Lawyers, uh, nothing. <laughs> Otherwise, it would probably be the end of my career, exclamation mark, so you have to be careful. <laughs> it is fitting that we're in the Royal Society for this event. Many of you will know, I suspect, the Royal Society was founded in 1660 at a time of great new learning, where there were ideas evolving about, as it was known then, the new science. But really to understand the phenomenon of the Royal Society, one needs to go back just over 60 years to a place called Gresham College, at which I was a law professor for a number of years. And Gresham College was born at a time where people were experimenting. They were messing about. They were having a taste of some new thinking, some new ideas, some new methods, experimenting, observing. It was the birth of science. But no one really knew about structure or method or process at that stage. But what happened, what grew out of Gresham College was the Royal Society. And the Royal Society put some structure, introduced some methods, some process, a more systematic way, a more scientific way of analyzing so many problems. And I think there's an important analogy we're seeing in the world of the web. Because in my view, we've come through the period of experimentation, and it has been entirely remarkable. And there have been in so many different disciplines, people engaged, involved, in the same way, having a taste, experimenting, observing. And what I see today, I hope, is the beginning of the new era. If the first era was the era that was analogous to Gresham College, what I think we're seeing today is the birth of a new Royal Society. And to give you a flavor of why that's important, what I want to do is just move off into a slightly different world, and that's my world of the law, and just give you a sense of how much the World Wide Web is coming to mean for the law. Now, I'm not talking about the substantive legal issues that arise from the web, and there are many. And indeed, Southampton has for many years been a leading center for research in the area of IT law, internet law, and so forth. No, I'm talking about the way in which our justice system works, the way in which the law is administered in society is being affected so radically by the World Wide Web. Now, notice I'm not talking here about lawyers. Now, many lawyers, when I talk about these subjects, understandably get defensive. But the law is no more there to provide a living for lawyers than ill health is there to provide a living for doctors. It's not the purpose of the law to keep lawyers in business. The law is a far more significant phenomenon than lawyers. And what we've seen through the last 20 years or so is a whole set of different attitudes towards the World Wide Web, reflected, I think, very well by J.B.S. Haldane, the wonderful evolutionary biologist, who in 1963, in an article in the Journal of Genetics, the article was called The Truth About Death, he said that scientific acceptance comes in four stages. And I think we can map that directly onto acceptance, or not, by the legal community of the World Wide Web. So the first phase is when people say, this is worthless nonsense. The second phase is where people say, this is an interesting, but it's a perverse point of view. The third stage is when people say, this is true, but it's quite unimportant. And fourthly and finally, people say, I've always said so. <laughs> and 
we're at the I've always said so stage. You'll have you'll hear senior partners of law firms and senior judges gravely intoning that they've been saying for decades that the law is in for a great shakeup. Absolutely not true. In fact, it was only since the economy fell off a cliff and it, we discovered that legal services were far too expensive that we might need to rethink the way in which we deliver them. And it may or may not be a coincidence, but what we're seeing is that the World Wide Web offers a whole bundle of new ways of solving legal problems. So we're under immense pressure. You'll have seen all the debates about the lack of public legal funding for average consumers who want to have legal representation. And you've seen also with major organizations, even the largest businesses in the world say they can't afford large-scale litigation. So we're at an inflection point, a time of immense change in the legal world. And coincidentally, we see a whole bundle of new ways that we can perhaps deliver legal services. I just want to roll back a little to give you a flavor of what it's like to be a technologist. I'm half a lawyer and half a technologist. But to be a technologist in the world of law, in 1996, I wrote a book called The Future of Law. And in that book, and I know it sounds completely daft in retrospect, but one of my main predictions was that lawyers and clients in the future would communicate by email. It is absolutely true that senior officials in the Law Society of England and Wales said I shouldn't be allowed to speak in public. They said I didn't understand confidentiality and security, that I was bringing the profession into disrepute by suggesting email might be used between lawyers and clients. That's not that long ago, 1996. And the point I make again and again to lawyers who've grown to accept that email might be useful is that there's no finishing line in information technology in the internet and the web. There's no finishing line at all. I will say, imagine for a second, this is a group of partners in a major international law firm. I spent half my life addressing them. And I'll say to them, if we'd assembled here maybe five or six years ago, no one would have heard of Twitter. How many of your users, or how many of your users today, I'll ask? And usually 5%. And I point out that half a billion people in the world now use Twitter. So I ask them, are, are they waiting for it to take off? What, what, what is it? And what we find in this world of law and technology is what I call irrational rejectionism, which I define as the dogmatic dismissal of an information technology with which the critic has no direct personal experience. It's quite remarkable that people, and people say there's so many web applications, oh, that won't work, and that's not for me, or oh, here's why we're different. And so this is the, the war I've had to fight. My battle started in the 1980s. Actually, Nigel, in many ways, my doctorate in Oxford was in AI. I was interested in AI and law. I defined the challenge of expert systems and law to make scarce expertise and knowledge more widely available and more easily accessible. That was my passion. I wasn't really that concerned about any particular enabling technology. But when the web came along, it seemed to me that that very same aim could be achieved in an entirely different way. And so what we have today, for example, is online legal advice. If people want legal guidance on particular issues, there are a wide range of wonderful online advisory systems. The best known legal brand in the United States now is not a law firm at all. It's LegalZoom.com, online documents and advice for small businesses and consumers. Online document drafting, answer for you see a series of questions on screen, out will come a polished first draft. That technology was really invented in 1981, but pre-web, it was hard to distribute it now dominates a number of areas of document drafting. Why on earth instruct a lawyer when you can essentially have a decision tree with pa paragraphs of text hanging off it available to you on the web? Or what about online dispute resolution? Think about eBay. How many disputes do you think there are? Disagreements every year on eBay. Have a think. None of you are anywhere close. <laughs> 60 million. 60 million disagreements every year at eBay. How many are sorted out in the courts? Almost none. Electronic negotiation, electronic mediation, electronic arbitration, a whole bundle of new techniques are emerging. Anathema to people who went to law school in the 70s and 80s, but practical, low-cost, non-combative ways of resolving disputes. This is fundamental to the future of our world. It's not peripheral. I ask the question, is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to congregate in one old building with people wearing wigs and robes to discuss a problem that arose two years ago and to pay more than the problem at issue? That's our justice system today. At the very least, we should be at virtual hearings through, for example, it doesn't even need to be telepresence. Even advanced video conferencing would work well. Legal education is changing as well. In Strathclyde University, which I've been involved for many years, for one of our courses for a year, we divide our students into law firms, law firms of four people. And they practice law in a fictional online place called Art Kalach. 
one of the law professors has written a long history of Ardkalach, its industry, its agriculture, how it evolved. And one actually feels one's living within this real space. And students communicate with clients, with policemen, with judges who are actually practicing lawyers, role playing. It's revolutionized the way you can immerse students in legal work before they actually arrive in the law office. We've come a long way in law, and gradually it does seem to me practitioners, judges, academics are embracing the new ways in which we might offer access to justice, administer legal provisions. And I think there was no better example of this and how we have arrived at a new era than the Lord Chief Justice, who's the top judge in England and Wales, who gave just a few weeks ago the annual Society for Computers and Law lecture called IT for the Courts, Creating a Digital Future. That was unimaginable just a couple of years ago. But the top judge in the land would stand up and speak for an hour in the way in which he wants our courts to be computerized, talking about the very phenomena I've been discussing with you today. And the Civil Justice Council have now asked me, rather than saying I shouldn't be allowed to speak in public, they've said, well, I lead a group that looks at online dispute resolution, how we can do two things. One, take a whole body of disputes that are clogging up our courts inappropriately just now, and secondly, offer far greater access to people for dispute resolution, which they cannot today afford. So it's becoming rather mainstream. But to return to my original theme about the importance of this event, when I'm asked by the Lord Chief Justice or by the Civil Justice Council to think strategically, to think about the policy issues, to discuss coherently the future of the web and law, I have to say I don't really have a discipline in which to rest. I can do all my effusing and hand-waving and saying it's generally a good thing, but it seems to me that we need greater process. We need new methods, systems, technologies to support more robust thinking as we introduce the web, not just to the law, but to many other areas that are vital to our working lives. And to look back round, this is why today is so very vital. We're through the Gresham College stage. In law, it took us 20 years to convince legal practitioners and, of course, consumer groups that we can and should deliver legal services at lower cost. But we're now in the Royal Society age. We need to think about these issues in a far more systematic and coherent way. And that inevitably involves multidisciplinarity. There's no question about it. And it's, I fear, actually it's not fear, it's in part excitement. The methodologies in social sciences, the methods of scientific, uh, natural sciences too, um, I don't think are yet adequate for the purpose. We're looking at an entirely different kind of phenomenon. And that's the excitement and that's the important. We need our thinking of the future to be underpinned by these new rigorous tools and methods. And your effort, Wendy and the entire team, seems to me to be absolutely pivotal to that. I want to set the bar high for you. Uh, I first of all, congratulate you, not just on behalf of myself, but on behalf of the Oxford Internet Institute, and we value the relationship greatly. But your interests are wider, and to that extent, I think, more ambitious and exciting. And it seems to me we should look upon this as perhaps the birth of a new royal society. Thank you.